One. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Sam Shea. I'm a chiropractor, an acupuncturist, um, functional neurologist here in New Zealand, and I'm the founder of 10pointwellness.com and the workonlinecourse.com. And today uh, I have the great pleasure of interviewing Todd Smith, who's a certified facilitator for the work of Byron Katie. Uh, Todd uh, has done his regular practice since January of 2007 of the work, which is actually um, right when I got introduced to the work uh, at Katie's New Year Mental New Year's Mental Cleanse, the December to January 2006 seven. Uh, cleanse. And so I have not done it regularly since January 2007. Uh, 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 Todd has though. So um, I, I very much look forward to, to, to talking with Todd uh, today. His website is theworkasmeditation.com. That is all, it's just all one word, theworkasmeditation.com. And uh, yeah, so Todd, thank you so much for for joining us today. And I wanted to ask you a couple questions. One is, how did you find the work? What? How did you come across it? Thanks, Sam. It's a real pleasure to be with you uh, this morning. Um, I found the work uh, at a time when I was going through quite a bit of emotional upheaval. Uh, I was in uh, a kind of stuck place in my relationship and was feeling very trapped, uh, feeling very frustrated, uh, disempowered, angry, all of that swirling inside and not knowing what to do with it. I really didn't have any tools to, um, to deal with that. And <clears throat> interestingly enough, my partner said, you should read Loving What Is by Byron Katie. <laughs> <laughs> Best advice ever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I remember where I was. I was in a bookstore in Richmond, Virginia. Oh, the irony. You should do the work, Todd. You I know. This book. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what? Advice is not bad when it comes from someone else. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so I did get the book. Um, he said, you know, the real deal, take a look. And so I read it. And I was literally pinching myself with every page of like, oh my God, this is the missing piece. This is what I've been looking for. And uh, so I read it that summer, 2006, and then I decided I'm going to start doing this on a regular basis. And beginning of January, that's that's what I started doing. Cool. So uh, what were you doing before the work? Did you, did you do any regular practice uh, that you could consider as something that was helping you become a more loving, less stressed, more present human being? Was, was there anything that preceded the work that you tried um, beforehand? Yeah, absolutely. Um, since, I've been, since I was a kid, uh, I've been practicing um, transcendental meditation since I was about six years old and have, have become a teacher of TM and have done a lot uh, with that. And I've and I still practice Transcendental Meditation. I love it. It's, it's just a sweet little meditation practice that I do. Um, and so, yeah, my whole life has kind of been interested in spiritual development, in um, finding true happiness, finding um, real spiritual content. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that is the background that I came to when I found the work. So then, if you've did, so, how many years had you done TM prior to finding the work? So you did it starting at age six. You did TM. So you started back really in two thousand seven. The work. How many? Yeah. So let's see. I started in nineteen seventy six with TM, and I started the work in two thousand seven. So about thirty one. years. Thirty years or so. Okay. So how is the work different than meditation? And what what is the what is the because you know some people may be thinking like well if you've done TM which is probably one of the most recognized names techniques in the whole world I mean we have to really give credit to Maharishi for making meditation a household name uh, and yet why is it that after thirty years of meditating like what was missing 
that you found the work was able to help you with that that meditation was not? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I find the two, <clears throat> the work and transcendental meditation, to be very complementary. Mm -hmm. Um, I think they're both going to the same place, peace, um, but they go at it from very different uh, directions. One, uh, meditation, you close your eyes, you leave the chaos of the world, you go inward and settle the mind to a nice quiet state. And there's a lot of bliss that comes out of that, a lot of peace that comes out of that, and a lot of rest that tends to dissolve the stresses and strains of life. And <clears throat> I have noticed that being very effective in my life. However, there are sometimes little areas of life that um, require attention in terms of things you actually have to do or clarity you need to gain in very specific relative terms. And meditation, I always think of as kind of like filling the, raising the tide in all the rivers slowly, simultaneously, um, whereas the work goes in specifically to where it is that you think where you actually have a problem, where you actually are stuck and, and lets you face that directly, look at it really closely and find out that actually that whole stuck thing was just an illusion in the first place. Um, so it frees you on specific levels, on, on spe with specific issues, and uh, whereas meditation tends to just loosen the, 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 the tightness overall, the, the work goes in and it's like surgery, just just but maybe surgery isn't even the right word because that would be cutting something out. It's more like melting the the, the stressful knots. Mm -hmm. uh, very, they're similar and they're different, and it's something that I consider and contemplate a lot. And um, you know, I'm sure that my understanding will evolve as I, as I continue to practice both of them. So, with with the work <clears throat> taking on, like, 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 I really like what you said about you know, meditation is a general. Let's let's keep Every, let, let's smooth out the overall thing, but there may be some eddies here and there that need to be attended to. Yet, how also, I, mean, I don't know if you've had the experience, I know I have, where I've done the work on something very specific, yet a day later, a month later, I encounter uh, a situation that's completely different than the one that I questioned where the this, this situation where I would have a normal stressful response to it and I notice that okay that didn't stress me out at that time I like at my first was like oh that's weird cool it's weird but I'm not stressing <laughs> out about yes. that thing anymore and I could only attribute it to the only thing I did radically different was doing the work on a completely different issue um, yes. and yet other aspects of my life have smoothed out. So how does how does that do you know how that how does that connect? Like you do the work on one thing, and yet it's not just that situation that's actually being helped. Can you can you go into that? Yeah, I think that's um, uh, that's my experience as well. I work on one area, some tiny minute area of my life, one particular situation where I got triggered, and as I get clear in that situation, then I find myself not tripping on so many other um, situations that are that are somewhat related. And my understanding of that is that I'm getting clear how to not get triggered by a particular stressor. And as I as I get clear in one situation, um, it's not rocket science to be able to apply it to other uh, similar situations. So really, it's not that I'm dealing with with the thing out there as much as I'm dealing with my own ability to handle um, these different things. So as, as I do the work, it looks like I'm working on something outside of myself, but really, this is self-inquiry. I'm working on myself. I'm getting clear on myself, and mm -hmm. I'm almost building another pathway in my, in my thinking to be able to, to deal with it in a non-stressful way. And once I see that, I always say, once I see the shortcut, it's really hard for me to go back to going the long, painful route. Interesting. So how have you noticed then, what are the specific ways you've, you've found benefits of doing the work? You know, as, aside from this ability to kind of go in with a specific, to, to have a skill set 
to go into a specific situation and question it. What have you actually noticed that has changed positively in your life? Well, the biggest thing has been my relationship. It, it just has gotten better and better and better and better. It went from a very stuck place and a very frustrating place to, to a place now where I'm very comfortable and, and, and very happy in relationships. So that was a process. That took a lot of judge your neighbor worksheets and a lot of, of doing the work. But each time I did, I got another piece of it. And I started taking, you know, I started taking more responsibility for myself and my part in it. And I think that's a really big part of, of doing the work is that it just starts showing me that I'm not a victim here, but I'm actually choosing to suffer. And so once I see that, I don't want to suffer. Why would I choose that? Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, I, I became less and less and less of a victim in my own relationship and more of a participant and more just started gaining a lot from it. So that's the biggest area, probably where I've done the most worksheets. Um, but I've also done the work on, you know, like when my mom died uh, in an accident, I was, I was um, shocked and went, started going through the grieving process like anyone would. Mm -hmm. But I started doing the work. I was already doing the work. And so I started doing the work on this whole situation of her death. And in about two months' time, I was completely through the grieving process. Wow. It, was, it, it went very quickly for me. And so I attribute that to... The only thing I was doing different was the work. I remember questioning things like, um, I need to figure out how it happened because she died in a plane crash. And I kept replaying how it was, must have happened and, and as if trying to prevent it. And just questioning that one thought shifted a huge chunk of it. Like, no, I don't need to figure out how it happened. It's done. It's the way, it, it's just the way it went. And so it helped me move into acceptance. Um, uh, I've done it uh, also uh, on issues, again, related to my partner coming out of the closet. Uh, we had been in a closet relationship for a long time. And to come out to, to my family, to my friends, you know, put it on Facebook, did all that. And it, was, uh, it took a lot of work beforehand to mm -hmm. do that. And the work really helped me in that way. I, I started imagining what my dad or my stepdad would be thinking and what they would say and working those judgments um, allowed me to get to a place where I was not so scared to, to actually come out of the closet. Um, those are a few of the things. I also use it a lot on mundane, everyday little things. I actually look and wait for something to trigger me um, because it doesn't have to be a huge thing. It doesn't have to be like one of my most huge issues in life. But everyday life will show me exactly what where I'm still a little stuck in my thinking and a small argument or a small fear or a little um, any kind of stressful reaction I make a note and I go to that situation and fill out a judge your neighbor worksheet from that particular situation and it's amazing what it shows me so it the work kind of for me is a way of just getting more and more sane in my everyday living what have you noticed about how other people have um, changed around you as you've been doing the work consistently over time? And again, it's not like, you know, I know for me, I, I had points where I was first starting where I was like, okay, I'm going to do the work so other people will be nicer to me, which is not, <laughs> <laughs> found out that's not how it works, but um, it's it's like, I, I came at it at one point in my growth with the work that I, I was coming at it from a motive of I want to do this so other people will be, be will treat me better, which is not people will treat me how they treat me, you know. Yet yeah. I also noticed that as um, as I started doing the work more regularly and more sincerely. Um, people were starting to change around me, not because I was trying to manipulate them or anything or being syrupy, nice or quote unquote spiritual or anything. It's just that people were changing or, and I don't even know if they were changing. It was just my perspective. I have no idea at this point. I'm even questioning that. Like, <laughs> is it just my perception of how they're behaving is changing? So have you noticed, what have you noticed about other people around you as you've been doing the work? 
Yeah, I have noticed um, some changes, and I, I agree with you also that basically um, I don't need people to change as much uh, when I do the work, and so um, it's sort of like an added bonus when they do start changing, um, but that's not actually what I sit to do the work with. Um, Great. Mm -hmm. You know, my partner is my partner. He's more or less the same as he was uh, six or seven years ago. Um, and my, but my experience of him is way different. Now I'm not picking a fight or being defensive with him. Um, and so it always takes two to, to tango. So if he's, if, if I'm not just willing to jump into battle, then suddenly he's got, there's no, there's no battle. There's no, you know, he could even come at me angry. And I, if I'm not defending myself and not like fighting back or attacking back, then the whole thing just dissipates very quickly. So um, what I find is that, that as I'm becoming more and more honest with myself, more and more vulnerable with myself, more and more just clear with myself, then the respect level from the other side seems to be going up. You know, it's like, okay, this guy's doing his work. Todd's doing his work. Um, and there's without even thinking of it in terms of doing the work it's just he's he's not um i think this is just my projection but that there's less to fight about there's less i'm willing to take a suggestion you know mm -hmm. one of my biggest things was criticism i hated to be criticized I hated to be told what to do that kind of stuff now it's like you know there might be sometimes little resistance but to a large degree there's a lot of openness so bring it on mm -hmm. and when people sense that kind of receptivity, they're not having to yell and scream to get it through your mm. your mind. You know, they they can just make a suggestion. You're like, wow, it's a great idea. Take it on, and we're moving together. So, yeah, that's 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 kind of my experience of it. It hasn't been like people have changed dramatically, but I have stopped resisting and have been able to experience. Um, their kinder side. I'm not, I'm not engaging in war. Mm. Interesting. You know, another thing also with my mom, I, I always had a resistance with her and there was always kind of a separation and I did some work on her and noticed that you know, I always wanted her to spend time with me, love me more or something like that. And, and uh, when I did the work, I realized that I was the one that was holding it all back. It was like I put up a glass wall between the two of us. And once I saw that and took that down, I realized how much she had been pouring love in my direction the entire her entire life. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's the part where it's uh, my perception. I think um, is is a part of it, and it prevents me from receiving the love that's already there. That's beautiful. You know, like people, people sense there's not a war, there's not a, 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 a war, there's less potential, there's no capacity for war on the other side. So their own defenses go down. And then your own perception of the, the war between you and the other person is changed. So then there's like what they were already doing to not engage you in war. You're like, oh, that's, that was the way it was the whole time, you know. Exactly. So, like a unilateral disarmament. You know, somehow, if someone had enough courage to do it, it just the whole thing starts yeah. dismantling. Interesting. Yeah. So how now? How long have you been actually teaching the work? I mean, you have your website, theworkismeditation.com. So uh, when did you become a certified facilitator? And then, in what capacity are you helping people? Uh, learn, understand, and go deeper into the work. And, and this is a pre-frame question into uh, what are the common myths or misunderstandings about the work that you find, particularly with new people who are just starting. So I wanted to give some people more background on how long you've been teaching and in what capacity you, you teach or, or facilitate the work for people. Okay, yeah. I uh, put up my website in 2010. Um, and I was not a certified facilitator at that time. Um, I 
took about two years to go through the certification program, and uh, it, I've been certified about a year and a half. So let's see, 2000, 2013 um, was when I was certified. Mm -hmm. um, I have been uh, been facilitating people all along. You don't have to be certified to facilitate no. uh, someone, mm -hmm. facilitate anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and the certification program is just a really nice way to get a lot of practice work, really clear on, on motives for why you're facilitating and all of that. But um, so yeah, I've been I've been doing it. I've been facilitating others more or less. Well. Thinking back, I was going to say more or less since 2010, but that's not right either. Since I started in 2007, because I started out by doing the work with other people, I'd facilitate them, they facilitate me, we just kind of trade that way. And so, in a sense, I've been facilitating the work um, from day one. But professionally, I've been doing it since 2010, and as a certified facilitator since 2010. So then, what? So then, what? What do you do? What is the ways that you actually? Uh, help new people learn and do the work? Is it through online? Is it through workshops? Is it through one-to-one -one phone calls? And uh, so how, how is it that you actually help people who are new to the work? Uh, yeah, I help people in a number of ways. Uh, the first way is through my newsletter. Uh, twice a week I send out a newsletter that is very knowledge oriented. It's not a big sales newsletter. It's about basically sharing my experience doing the work, sharing the experience of my clients doing the work. And people tell me that it's very insightful and helpful for them as they're learning the work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and they are. I've, I'm on your newsletter list and they're good. They're very good. And the, the, some, of the, some of the checklists that you've made for, um, you know, going going deep and it's it sounds kind of clinical like you made a checklist on the judge your neighbor worksheet but it's very helpful to it's it's just it's sometimes helpful to be grounded with the systematic checklist of going through some of these processes to identify and then question the stressful thoughts so they're they're very insightful uh, i would absolutely agree great thank you yeah that checklist that you mentioned is is um it's free for anyone who signs up for the newsletter, and it's a basically a, a way of of going through when you're filling out a judge or neighbor worksheet and just seeing, did you look at this? Did you look at this? Did you look at this? Mm -hmm. And as you go through, you may start noticing even more of what was actually going on when you're filling out your worksheet. And yeah. So it can be helpful. So that's one one way that I uh, support people in, in learning the work and getting started with the work. Um, and in continuing with work, I even had one client who was a certified facilitator said, "You know, this should be required. This is like graduate school for the work or something." <laughs> so, right. You know, it's for for all uh, experience levels with the work. Um, and then my my main emphasis as a facilitator is to encourage people to do the work, and most especially to do it, make it a kind of a steady practice. Um, I find that that using the work as a preventive tool, as doing it just every day a little bit, um, has been very effective for me. And I encourage other people to take advantage of this tool in the same way. So I have a number of ways that I support people. I do private sessions, um, a lot of them by, by phone or Skype. Uh, I do private retreats where people will come and, and for a couple days or even up to five days um, stay as a guest, guest in my home and and uh, do the work with me all day. It's a, it's a oh, interesting. So you actually have a one-to-one -one in depth, uh, okay, kind of your own, uh, what is it? Uh, Katie has her like turnaround house, and so you got, that's, which is 28 days, and you have a five day kind of one-to-one. -one, that's really interesting. Yeah, it's, okay. a, it's a wonderful way to do the work, and, it, and it's, it's, people really enjoy it. It's like you come, you stay in our guest room, we feed you, we, we take care of you, and then we just sit and do the work all day, you know, morning, afternoon, and evening. Cool. And really go deep with that. So, um, going to this question of what are the common myths or misunderstandings people have when they, when they there, there's different when they first find out about the work and then when they first start doing it. Like where where are these myths and misunderstandings, if there are any? 
Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's going to be different for each person. Um, the, the work is really just four questions and these turnarounds and examples of turnarounds. And I think um, if there's any common misunderstanding, it might be that this is this is going to be like uh, some kind of magic or quick fix kind of thing. This is like any meditation practice. It is a process. And yes, you can get amazing insights in one instant. You know, you watch any of the videos of, of uh, Byron Katie doing the work with people, the transformations are fast and deep. And I experienced that in my own work as well. Uh, and, and with my clients as well. Um, however, it it's not like you just do one piece of work and now you're just like everything's just hunky dory it's a, it's a process each piece of it holds another a certain aspect of the stress load so um, again that's why I invite people to make it a practice to to just put in the time on a, on a somewhat regular basis whatever that is for you it might be once a week it might be once a day it might be once a month or once a year but just kind of somewhat of a, of a pace to it. Um, so misconceptions with the work, um, it shouldn't be a misconception because it's called the work. It's not, yeah. it's not, <laughs> it's not called anything else. It's work. <laughs> the other thing that I think uh, is valuable, and this kind of plays into to what you're offering on your website, which I really appreciate, is um, just a little bit of process it takes to, to gain familiarity with it. And, and how, you know, it's kind of like when you start riding a bicycle, you kind of have to try a few times and fall off and you have to, you have to, um, to, it's not just like you jump on the bike and you're a pro riding. Um, so it is easy, it is simple, but there's a lot of subtlety to the work. And the subtlety lies in, in what you can find inside. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one, one misconception is, that I can do this whole thing intellectually and and just have that be working for me. Um, what I experience is when I use the intellect to point me in the right direction, but then allow the questions to settle into me and actually allow my heart to come with the answers, that's what really starts to transform me. So, um, I think that is a misconception that people think it's an intellectual exercise, and in reality, it's something a lot deeper. So, what is what is the most difficult part for people new to the work that you've seen? What are some common patterns that people really struggle with when they're starting with the work? Uh, three things come to mind. One is writing down your stressful thoughts. Sometimes people don't want to write them down because they're not they're they don't want to. They don't want to see how how their mind is actually um, it's easier to stay in denial than to actually mm -hmm. write down what um, you're actually thinking and believing. So allowing yourself to become really petty, really um, honest about what's going on with you when you're writing your worksheets or writing your, your thoughts to question. That's one area, uh, and for some people that's not an issue at all, but I do notice that some people resist that. Um, the other area is sometimes question four, who would you be without that thought? Mm -hmm. People are very uh, attached to the way that they are thinking, and, um, and it takes a little, uh, just a little stillness to experience, who would I be without that thought? And I'd say a third area is the turnarounds. Um, finding the turnarounds to some degree and then finding examples that are genuine of why the turnarounds are as true or truer. That's, um, that's really an important part of doing the work. And sometimes it can be challenging when you're first starting. It can actually always be challenging. You're challenging yourself to, to basically um, give evidence for why the opposite of what you believe is true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that takes, um, it takes some real stillness. It takes some real openness. And so I'd say those would be the most challenging aspects of 
Are there, um, so there's, this is a slightly different question. There's, there's what's the most difficult part for people new, but then there's like, what are the most common mistakes? Like, in terms of process wise, like we have the four questions. Is it true? Can you absolutely know that it's true? How do you react? What happens when you believe the thought? Who would you be without the thought? And then the turnarounds, you know, to, to the opposite, to the, to the other, to the self, you know, um, what's, um and there's other there's other turnarounds that one can do as well but what is um what's a common mistake that you see people do where they get kind of off track from actually doing the work or they think they are but they're actually not yeah <clears throat> one common thing to do is to jump into defense or justification when you're doing the work when you're mm -hmm. answering the questions it's like uh like is that true? No, but you know, in this case, blah, blah, blah. And you start, start justifying or start defending your position. So it's a way of kind of touching in, doing lip service to the work, but then really just staying in your same stuck paradigm. Um, yeah. So that, that's mm -hmm. one where you can fool yourself. You think you're doing the work, but actually you're just kind of just staying in the same place. Um, the other area where sometimes it happens is just just busy mind just gets distracted and starts getting off, forgetting what the question was. Um, and that's the value of working with a facilitator. They can just bring you right back and say, okay, you know what, you've been off in the story here. Uh, <laughs> I remember I, I, do, I do the work about once a week with uh, Brian and, you know, and he asked me a question and I, and, and, he asked me one of the questions and I, and then I like my mind, like for some, like this, sometimes resistance pops in and like my mind goes woo, way off in some other direction. And like, I come back and what, what did you ask me? And like, and, and I know the four questions, but for some reason, like it just goes gone. Like, ask me that question again. And it's so fascinating to see how, even it's the same four questions my my internal experience can just so be so different based on what situation i'm questioning like the mind is so attached to keeping the story that it will wander far away and i need to just be asked again sometimes multiple times the same question usually it's number four how do would i react and i'm like i just have no concept of that of who would i be without that thought and I have to have Brian ask it to me several times before something lands, you know, or not something, but something emerges out of me, yeah. you know, as yeah. a genuine example. Yeah, I think your, your experience is mine as well, like that little resistance, you know. Mm. I don't want to go there or something, and then I, I go off into a story as almost a distraction mm -hmm. boy for myself. Right. Um, and luckily, if I keep getting brought back, um, then eventually I do hear the question, do decide to answer it and then actually experience something through it. So are there any other common mistakes that people have doing the work, especially when they're starting out? Um, one other way that I see people do is um, write the worksheet and, be, and say, oh, you know, but it's not really that big of a deal. Um, kind of mm. almost discredit the, the the stressful place they were feeling um, when they were writing the worksheet. And it just pops them out. It's like almost gives them a reason why they don't actually have to go through the process of doing it. So um, I always tell people there's two parts to the mind. There's like this, this stuck part and there's this wise part that knows this is really not a big deal. It's not important. You know, like we're kind of, I'm over that. Mm -hmm. And you might be 99% over it, it's not a big deal, but the work is for that 1% that is still stuck. And so I just invite people to go back to the stuck place where they were and answer the questions from there and let that little one piece that's still stuck gain the same enlightenment that the rest of your mind has. Um, because otherwise, you, from one perspective, yeah, you don't really need to. But that one little piece can make a huge difference in your happiness. So it's worth it in your experience to go back and, and 
find those little things. Give them their time. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I had the 10 years of doing meditation and breathing techniques and whatnot. And I, I, one justification I had in my head was like, oh, well, I'm, I've already meditated on this for so long. I, I do, you know, I am just so, I know all this knowledge, you know, and so, oh, this thing, oh, it's just so petty. I'm just going to not give it any energy or I will not think about yeah. it or I will not. And, and really, when I, I got into the work and I went back to situations where there was this 1% re residue, um, I really found that the one per questioning that, that last one, questioning the 1%, this is not an economic sta statement. <laughs> this is not a political statement, questioning the 1%, um, the 1% of the mind. Uh, although it's interesting, though, you can see you know, uh, when I was watching all the, the, the Wall Street, you know, Occupy Wall Street stuff, you can see the amount of stress that people were carrying about the concepts of around money and wealth. And what I found fascinating is that when I was doing the work on money and around, you know, the 1%, it was where am I, turning around the thoughts, where am I greedy? Where am I disrespectful of other people's humanity time resources basic needs where have i been you know deceptive with am i charging interest on people whether it's emotional interest or is it financial interest or is it a f interest in favor you know do they where am i doing the very same things that i'm accusing the one percent of doing and in the same way it's like Oh, it's the one percent. I can just they're just kind of be flipping about it. But in my head, it's like really festering. And like the one percent of any situation, I can flippantly dismiss it. But if I question that one percent, it's just so much is released and melted away, as you said before. Yeah, it's like if you have a little <laughs> cut on your pinky, you know, it's like it's not a big deal. You could just say, "Fine," you know, it's I'm, I'm totally fine. But that little tiny cut can cause a lot of your attention to go there like you almost get totally drawn into it so mm -hmm. these little small thoughts that we think are not a big deal they actually can hold a lot of our energy just mm -hmm. caught up in them and when you go in and give them a chance to be heard and a chance to be really questioned and turned around um, my experience is it really does free up a lot of that energy mm -hmm. so um, going to the work and uh, a lot of people come to the work with, uh, you know, reasons why they start the work, whether it's a relationship issue or physical body pain or dealing with a loss or dealing with something else. How, how do you navigate doing the work around relationships, particularly if, like in your case, you, you had a relationship, says, here, you need this. <laughs> Turned out right. to be right. <laughs> Right. Uh, how, how do you navigate doing the work when you're in a relationship, particularly if, A, your partner doesn't understand what you're doing, or, it, or you think that you need the partner to do it with you, or it's like, it, it's, the work can get very sticky between partners, you know, uh, especially if one is, yeah, how, you know, especially, like, for me, I was kind of in the early stages of the work, and like you need the work because I'm stressing out thinking about you. Therefore, you need to fix your mind. Yeah. So can you say something about doing the work in relation, particularly if you're in a partnership already and you're into it and the other person isn't? Well, for me, the, the real bottom line is if I think that they need the work, I need the work. You know, it's, it's as simple as that. There, it, doing the work does not require the other person to do the work mm -hmm. like i have done tons of work on my in my relationship with my partner he's done a little bit he went to the school he's done done some and we do it together every once in a while but it's it's not a it's not like a major thing for him whereas for me it is this is this is how uh, this is how i've been able to uh, move from a place of 
unhappiness to happiness. Mm -hmm. But it didn't require any participation from his side whatsoever. And mm -hmm. that, um, that really, that understanding, as I slowly got that, um, really gave me a sense of freedom. Because if we have an argument, I can just go and do my work on it, get clear about it. Um, uh, it doesn't require him. I don't have to, you know, this is the thing in partnerships. It's very easy to use the work as a weapon. Okay. Yeah. And, go say more. That's, that's, that's what I want. Yeah. Please say more about yeah. that. And this is not the work. It, it's like, you should do the work. Oh, is that true? You know, I think you should question that, that those, those are, those are war calls. Those are, are offensive strategies of a stuck mind. That's not the work. The work is inquiry when you come to it and you want to do it yourself. So, you know, it's very different when you're in facilitation versus when you're in a relationship. When I'm facilitating somebody, they've chosen to come to work with me. They want me to hold them in their work. They want me to be almost tough with them. And so that's my job. My job is to hold them in inquiry. I would, I would say, I would question that, you know, is that true? I, I give them right. Context. All of that. Yeah. But outside of the of facilitation, my partner didn't come to me to do the work. He didn't come here to get, you know, to, to do the work at all. So I I'm not going there. I'm not saying is that true to him. I'm not saying, oh, you know, that'd be a good judge your neighbor worksheet. Or I'm not saying, you know, you should do the work on that. I might say, um, I would love to do the work with you on this one, um, if that is true for me but not with the motive to fix him just because I want to do the work with him. So I have to be really clear about my business and his business. My business is to take care of my own freedom, my own, my own happiness. His business is to take care of his own freedom, his own happiness, and it may or may not involve the work. So I've gained a lot of respect for all the different ways you can gain clarity. Work is one of them, but there are many, many, many others, including just letting life show you. <laughs> I have respect for that. Um, and if that's where, if that's what my partner wants to do, perfect. Uh, and he actually has many ways of, of gaining clarity. So I think that's a really key point. It's like, don't use the work as a weapon to, to basically tell your partner that they're wrong. Um, it's, it's not helpful. Have you ever seen it used in the reverse, using it as a shield? Oh, that's interesting. Um, when I think about it, I can definitely see that um, as a shield, as a defense. Um, yeah, I can see how it's possible. I'm not coming up with a, of an example at the moment, but I'm thinking like if I was um, saying, oh yeah, no, I'm working on it or something like that as a shield, then it might be putting off actually having an honest discussion. So, um, or I can figure this out all by myself. Well, maybe having the other person involved is actually an important part of it too. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent clear on an example. Of so that, a shield, I mean, what, what comes to mind is like, is like someone comes at me with, with something that, and I would say like, oh, well, I'm, I'll just go do the work on that, you know? And okay. Yeah. yeah. Now this is yeah. Okay, I get it. It's like staying in an abusive relationship, for example. It's like, oh, I'll just do the work on that, and I'll be fine with it. I'll just become complacent or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's not also the whole story either. It's like if I'm using the work to stay in a place that isn't that isn't healthy, then I'm not actually. Um, really being honest with myself and the work is about honesty so in a sense i'm using the work as a shield from taking responsibility and standing up for myself and doing what is actually true for me. so yeah i can see that okay interesting uh, any last bits of um advice for people who are really just starting starting the work or any any other things that you wish that you were you could tell yourself back in 2007 when you were first starting that uh 
that you've come to realize after after doing it for these years what what, what would you kind of be as kind of final final thoughts uh, for people especially those new to the work my final thoughts are to just do it just do the work like talking about the work uh, trying to understand it um, explaining it reading about it these are all good and interesting but the real transformations happen by actually doing it mm. and so that's that's my that's my experience and that's what I invite others to do as well to just do it and to make it a practice you know even if it's once a week or once a month or if you can if you're really into it once a day but make it some kind of a practice where you're like you kind of have the time carved out for it and you just show up at that time it's sort of like doing a sport or doing a meditation practice or yoga or, or whatever um, you know there's there's something about coming back to it on a regular basis that really deepens it and allows it to kind of pick off where you pick, start up where you left off and just take it to the next level and the next level and the next level um, and I've been doing this now for seven or eight years I can't remember exactly uh, yeah I'm gonna be eight years in, in January and um, it just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper I, I'm amazed I've been doing these same four questions and these turnarounds for eight years and I'm not yet bored of them. <laughs> mm. I'm not like I'm not like oh the same old story again. It's every time fascinating, every time different. I mm. learn something new on the on every time, but it just keeps getting subtler and subtler and subtler. And so, for me, that's the value of making it um, a practice. Interesting. Thank you. Now, if just for every, all of our listeners, again, your your website is theworkasmeditation.com. No dashes, no dots, no spaces. Just theworkasmeditation.com. And I encourage people watching this. The uh, there's on the about page where you'd click. Uh, you click on the about. There's two videos of you actually doing the work with Katie. Record and that in 2009 or so. And they're, they're awesome. So if you actually want to see uh, Todd in the hot seat, um, <laughs> he's got <laughs> he's got so he's got two videos there. So Todd has Todd. You offer private sessions, uh, group sessions, kind of online uh, self study. Uh, you've got your newsletter. You've got all these great checklist stuff. I mean, just really really awesome really really awesome stuff i love i love what you've done with this a lot and yeah. uh, they can go to your website and that's where they can opt in for your newsletter and they'll get these checklists and uh, get your perspective on on the work is are there in that's the main website they should go to right the work is meditation.com that's the only website i have yeah. okay uh, workasmeditation.com and you'll see all the things that I offer and there's a lot of resources on there, a lot of articles that I've written on mm -hmm. there as well. Um, you were mentioning the, the online forums. I have a, several different forums where we come together and do the work in written form mm -hmm. um, on, a, on a forum and that's another way to do the work. So I try to make it as easy as I can to fit all the different ways I can think of um, to make it easy for you to do the work to actually come in and make it a practice. And whether that's working one-on-one -on -one, or whether that's working in retreat or workshop settings mm -hmm. or whether that's doing it online. Um, you know, I even have an email facilitation program. So, you know, it's whatever, whatever I can do to support you, to support yourself. Cool. And you've got some teleconference recordings and you've got, some, you've got a book, some session recordings. This is great stuff, man. This is great. Okay, so thank you so much, Todd, uh, for 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 uh, for joining us. Um, and uh, please uh, encourage everyone. Please get on Todd's mailing list. Um, we'll we'll be talking with Todd again, uh, and probably doing a bit more kind of the more nuts and bolts, nitty gritty of certain like i'd like to go over another interview like your checklist particularly over the judge and neighbor worksheet i think that'd be a fantastic call 
uh, to go over because I think the judge and neighbor worksheet, the, the, some of the questions people, including myself, only until recently really got the nuanced differences between, but between yeah. those questions. Um, so thank you again. Uh, this is again Todd Smith from theworkismeditation.com. Uh, my name is Dr. Sam Shea, uh, founder of Ten Point Wellness and theworkonlinecourse.com. And uh, yeah, please again sign up for Todd's newsletter. You'll love it as I do. And uh, we'll talk again soon, Todd. Okay. Great. Thank okay. you, Sam. Thank you, Todd. Okay. Bye. Bye.